Hi, it's Wesley with 22 Zines, and today I want to talk about the February full moon, which I am dubbing the mud moon. Um, right now, as a filming, Massachusetts is starting to welcome the late winter season. There are still snowy days, but the snowfall is a lot less than it was just a couple weeks ago. The snow melts a lot faster, and this is kind of that time of year of very erratic temperatures that flip-flop between 25 degrees to 40 degrees to 7 degrees to 50 degrees from day to day. Um, in Colorado, where I grew up, this would be the time that we would start to see crocuses popping out of the snow uh, in our front yard. Uh, but right here, right now, in Massachusetts, uh, the thing that I'm noticing the most is the mud. Uh, because it is warm enough that melting snow skips the phase where it makes a sheet of ice and instead mixes with the earth immediately to make mud. And um, for a lot of reasons, uh, mud has just been on my mind lately and uh, full moons and full moon names have been on my mind, so I guess it's just going to be kind of a loose chat about that, where I'm going to talk a little bit about my thoughts on moon names and moon naming in general, different kinds of moon names. Um, I'm going to talk about the symbolism of mud and, of course, why I am deciding to call this the mud moon. And then at the end, I'm going to share my tarot full moon spread with you, like the cards that I drew for my full moon tarot spread. So first I want to talk a little bit about the moon names and where they come from and how I relate to them. This is something that I've really just started researching, so I will say right now I'm not an expert, and the information that I'm receiving is primarily from Wikipedia, Old Farmer's Almanac, and a few other places. Um, many of you know <laughs> that there are specific names for specific moons. And um, from what I've gathered, essentially the moon names were the names for the months on a lunar or a lunar solar calendar, uh, which makes sense because the word moon and the word month are closely related. They have a similar root. Um, and each culture that participated in naming the moons had their own names that represented the uh, nature of the season in the area, agricultural practices, um, holidays and, you know, cultural practices for their specific group and their specific area. Um, I think that the best thing that I've found is this page from Western Washington University, which I will link below, and uh, the information was gathered by a Native American history scholar and a member of the Cherokee Nation, which is basically a big list of the full moon slash month names from a variety of Native American tribes. And it is really cool, and it shows some of the diversity of moon names and how they uh, differ between areas. Really love it. Definitely check it out. The names that are probably most well known in America, at least today, are the names that the Old Farmer's Almanac has adopted and uh, published in their almanac. So it's pretty likely that you've heard of the Harvest Moon, for example, and that's one of the sort of standardized names that the almanac has come out with. And uh, February's moon, roughly like the moon, the second moon or the moon that happens in February-ish, has been declared by the almanac as the Snow Moon. And I have mixed feelings about these somewhat standardized moon names. Um, I really like the central concept of naming the moons. I could say something about how it makes me feel more connected to individual moons and seasons, or aligns my witchdom closer with the moon to feel more balanced, or whatever. Like, I was kind of trying to come up with a reason as to why I like it, or why I think it's important, or what, you know, the reason that I like it that would sound like sort of a witchy reason, but frankly I think that I just like naming things, and names are by themselves important and meaningful enough for me that um, 
I'm not really going to analyze it further than that right now. Uh, maybe later when I start to dive more into uh, witchcraft theories and things, which I have been doing right now a little bit, and it, it's something I'm very interested in, but um, it's just feeling a little limiting for me right now, so I'm I'm not getting into that as of yet. But suffice it to say, I really like the concept of naming the moons. Um, I feel a little bit iffy about using the Almanac Adopted standardized ones. Um, for one, the selection of names is sort of a mix uh, between names used by various Native American tribes and colonial sensibilities. Um, and I guess I'm just a little concerned about whether or not this is a case of colonialization removing the names from their original context, culture, and practices. Um, cultural blending does happen naturally, absolutely, um, but it is often hard to pick out when it's a case of blending and when it's a case of appropriation or of imposition of certain values above others. Um, and generally, I feel like I would have a harder time uh, trusting the almanac or just kind of going with it because it is a colonial publication. A lot of these uh, standards and names were sort of set during uh, colonial times, and it just makes me wonder a little bit. Uh, uh, I want to know more about where that came from. And it's certainly not as serious as this, but it just, what pops into my mind are the Indian schools where they stripped Native Americans of their culture and forced English speaking. I mean, I shouldn't even say they, I should say we white people colonizers did that. Um, and that is clearly not a case of cultural blending. It is a case of cultural assertion and cultural erasure, like asserting one culture as being the superior one and being the one that gets to gets to make the decisions about um, what is a valid part of culture and what isn't. Um, and I kind of, I just wonder how much of that similar attitude is present, if any, in the case of these moon names. So I will say right now, I don't know. And that is why I don't feel entirely comfortable with the Almanac standardized names, because um, I don't feel comfortable engaging with something until I know a little bit more about where it came from, and especially if it's something that's potentially harmful or represents something that was harmful. Um, I think the reason that this is especially important to me is because, like I said, I place a lot of importance on names, and I feel like if I'm going to take that step in my practice, or whatever you want to call it, to personally attribute a name to something. Um, that feels like an important decision that I don't want to take lightly, and so it's not something that I want to defer to a potentially harmful or historically harmful publication to do that for me. <clears throat> um, even setting that aside, which I... I I don't want to set that aside, but in addition to that, there's sort of the issue, a fundamental issue with trying to standardize the names of the moons just in in general, um, because uh, at least when you're using this naming, uh, this nature-based naming convention, um, and that is that different regions are going to experience the moons differently, and they're going to experience the seasons differently. So it seems strange to defer to a name that doesn't reflect my local experience and local knowledge necessarily. Um, for example, according to the aforementioned Western Washington University page, the one that is linked below, the Pueblo people named the February moon Moon of the Cedar Dust Wind, the Lakota people named it When the Trees Crack Because of Cold, and the Zuni people named it No Snow in Trails. All of those names are fucking cool. <laughs> um, none of them reflect the things that I experience or that I notice in Massachusetts. The almanac name of Snow Moon is 
kind of closer for my particular region. Um, there are definitely snowstorms, but by now winter has been going on long enough that there have been many snowfalls by now, so I don't know that I personally associate snow with the February moon in particular. The point of this very long-winded build-up is that I've been fiddling with the concept of coming up with my personal names and personal associations with the moons uh, that reflect the seasonal things that happen in my region and are the things that I actually <laughs> notice and that are not other people's um, assertions. <laughs> I can't remember where I heard this prompt exactly. I think it was probably in one of Molly Roberts' videos. I will link her channel below. Excellent art witch videos. Um, but there's a suggestion about making a list of things that you notice about the changing seasons, the things in your region, your culture, and your life that make you personally feel or think, yes, this is spring, or this is insert season. And uh, <laughs> so back in, like, my, my sort of first foray into this is that back in December of 2020, I sort of somewhat hesitantly declared the December moon the mouse moon. And I wrote it in my notebook. Here, I'll actually try to find the page. I wrote it in my notebook with a bunch of little disclaimers about, like, if I did this sort of thing, I'd call it the mouse moon. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, all those disclaimers and things. That might be something I talk about a little later because, uh, you know, it's neither here nor there. But, like, here's my page that I wrote about the mouse moon. And maybe I'll talk more about the mouse moon and, and talk about, you know, basically what I wrote in here later, but this is February, and so <laughs> I'm going to talk about the February moon, which is what I've declared the mud moon. So now I'll get into a little bit more about why I call it the mud moon and sort of the symbolic associations um, of mud for me. <laughs> The names that I give to the moons sit best with me when they make sense both in a natural sense and in a symbolic sense. Um, and in a natural sense, if you live in a place like mine, it is pretty easy to see why I've called it the mud moon. Um, mud is absolutely everywhere right now, and it's only going to get muddier as the snow continues to melt. Uh, it is impossible for anything to stay clean, including the snow itself. The snow that melts leaves huge streaks of dirt touching anything that is or was outside, leaves a big patch of dirt wherever you touched. My boots get caked in mud very easily from taking my dog outside for walks, and and my dog himself being a basset hound. He is so low to the ground and very short, so his entire belly gets completely covered in mud every time that we leave the house. Uh, so that's the sort of the natural sense. In the symbolic sense, there's a lot of aspects of mud that I feel represent and reflect the feelings that I experience during this season. Mud is sort of a combination of water and earth, where earth ends up suppressing water by retaining it. And the freedom and expansiveness of water, the fluidity, the motion, and all the things that make it water, is is held back by Earth. Um, and I feel like this combination expresses itself as a very slogging, inhibiting thing. Um, if we think of the elements in tarot terms, then the water of the cups represents emotions, and the Earth of Pentacles represents work. And so the emotions and sort of the free-feeling, free-flowing aspects of it are being suppressed by the work and structural aspects of Earth. I think that work is often an inhibiting thing, um, and the structure and stability and general containment of work feels to me right now to be especially incongruent with the season in general. The temperatures are in constant flux, and the muddy earth is very messy and very unstable, and these things aren't conducive to a comfortable work environment for me. Um, generally, I don't like having to keep organized at a time when the earth is messy. 
on a practical note, for one, uh, dressing for work is a lot harder because things get dirty more quickly, and I have to keep a wide variety of work-appropriate clothes clean, from sweaters to thinner button-ups, and not to mention keeping my work shoes clean, which will of course get covered in mud during the very brief trip from my car to the building. <laughs> the mud definitely slows everything down. Mud and dirt makes its way into the house. Laundry piles up, which means more time is spent on cleaning the floors and the clothes, which means that dishes end up piling up. And generally, everything feels like a lot more work and it feels like it's going a lot more slowly. And I think that sort of speaks to a more overall feeling of, of feeling stuck. Mud <laughs> is sticky. Mud grabs onto your feet and drags you down as you walk through it. And moving through mud is slogging and plodding and generally a very heavy experience. And this tends to be how I feel right now and frequently has been around this time of year. Um, it's around that time when I'm pretty solidly into my semester. So any excitement or nervousness has been dulled down and I have a really solid understanding of just how slowly the semester will go and how much work I have ahead of me, um, which at this point is usually a lot. It's sort of like when, you know, you can feel overwhelmed when you're looking out at a lot of things and you have no idea how it's going to work, how it's going to happen, how you're going to achieve all this. And it's almost a different feeling when you have started the project or when you've started working, you have plowed a few lines and then you look out and you see all of these unplowed rows that you have to do now because now you have a personal feeling and knowledge where you know exactly how sucky it's going to be and you know how much work you're going to have to put in so it feels um it's a very special type of um overwhelm it's a very special feeling of insurmountability um yeah i feel like in general, it's harder for me to climb my way out of problems because everything just feels like so much work and I can see that there's so much work ahead of me. Um, any lightness brought in from the emotional reward side of things is dulled because I see just how much farther there is to go and how much more work there is ahead. It's sort of like overall having a very heavy weight that I have to drag a very long distance. Um, and it and it is it is heavy. It feels muddy. Um, I tend to be more forgetful around this time of year. I feel the urge to want to weasel out of things and to um, cut a lot of my responsibilities um, or just drop the ball, but I don't and I'm diligent. Because I know if I dropped the ball, it would be much more difficult to fish it out of the mud. And yet, <laughs> mud is also strangely inviting and liberating. Mud, uh, at this time of year, is sort of the proof that the earth is warming up again. Since water melts into the earth instead of just remaining as sheets of ice, until the next snowstorm, and it's a sign that we are heading toward this fiery, explosive spring. I think mud has the possibility of bringing a very childlike happiness when the messiness is embraced. There is a sort of classic image of kids making mud pies in the dirt. Uh, for me, it's when my dog jumps on me or chases after a rabbit or just trots right through a mud puddle and doesn't even care if he gets dirty. Um, dogs at the dog park just running and jumping and playing and jumping on me and not noticing the difference about whether there's dirt or not. Um, and there's, sort of, there's a Calvin and Hobbes comic that I'm reminded of, which I will go ahead and put up here. Uh, Calvin's talking about grass stains in this one, but I think that it equally applies to mud. And he says, wow, look at the grass stains on my skin. I say, if your knees aren't green by the end of the day, you ought to seriously re-examine your life. <laughs> um, 
there's another line also <laughs> that I saw on a Tumblr post that I did not think to save, so I can't properly give credit. Uh, but it keeps popping up in my head, and that is that human beings, whether for good or for evil, are inherently ridiculous. And I think that this is kind of the key to thriving during the mud moon. <laughs> if you can imagine getting your boot stuck in the mud and trying to wrench it out only for your boot to come off, stay stuck in the mud, and the momentum pushing you face forward, <laughs> face, face plant into the mud, just in time to see your bus drive past you. <laughs> that is what the entire month feels like to me. And at that point, the only reasonable response is to kind of laugh. Just, just to laugh at it. And yeah, I realize I am starting to sound a little hokey, like one of those shallow New Age books that claim that a good attitude is the solution to all your problems. And I don't mean it like that. Um, but rather that mud captures a sort of raw creativity, unrefined, not so rigid, imperfect, and ridiculous. Uh, lately, I have been listening to some Discworld books chronicling <laughs> the adventures of Moist von Lipvig, uh, which it starts with going postal, and I'm on the second book in the little m trilogy uh, called Making Money. And uh, Moist's books heavily feature golems, which in Discworld are giant figures made out of mud and clay and given life with a set of written instructions in their head. And I think it's kind of ridiculous in the best way that we see mud and think, what if this was person-shaped? <laughs> and of course, Terry Pratchett is the late king of profound ridiculousness. So it's those natural associations and symbolic associations that made me feel like the name Mud Moon is appropriate for February, and that is the, the name that I'm going to be um, working with, at least for now. And uh, so now I wanted to take the chance to share uh, what my full moon reading was. I like to do a tarot reading for myself on the full moon. Um, so I'll show you the spread positions that I use and and just go through what my actual cards were for this month. For that I used the Blind the Sun Tarot, which I may have to do a little walkthrough on because I think that this is a very uncommon <laughs> um, tarot. I got it just directly from the artist, which I will um, place a link to that, which it's blindthesun.com. I'll put a link in the in the description. So I wanted to share my full moon spread. Um, the spread that I usually use for full moon stuff is one that I adapted from the moon book by Sarah Faith Gottesdiener. Um, and the uh, spread positions, basically this is the first one. It is uh, me and how I'm feeling and who I am this month. And for this month I got death. This upper one here is how the moon can support me this month, and I got the Knight of Wands. Down here is how the Earth will support me this month, and I got the Two of Swords. The uh, fourth card is what's coming up, which I got the Emperor. The uh, next card is how I can prepare for it, and I got the Devil. The next is what I can gain from it, which I got the Six of Wands. And the last is what I can put forth, where I got the Knight of Pentacles. So, um, the very broad stroke story of this spread to me is that I am in a period of transformation. I am supported by the moon with energy and strength, a sort of Sagittarian philosophy and exploration kind of thing. Um, I'm shielded from anxiety and from things that I can't prepare for by the earth. Um, coming up will be some questions of authority or problems with existing structures, and I'll probably feel like they're holding me back. I can deal with this by taking a close look at what's really holding me back, um, which structures are actually restrictive and which only feel that way, and where I need to set boundaries or work outside of those structures. I can transform this feeling of entrapment into victory, success, and harnessing the sort of Sagittarian fire for um, 
my own, uh, my own gain. And I can put out a new structure that has been improved. Um, Knight of Pentacles is associated with Virgo, and at least for me, and um, it's sort of like how Virgo likes to improve things, and generally I can follow my own steady path forward. Um, yeah. So to go more into it, I feel like there's a lot of themes of structure and dominance. Um, I feel like I can elementally see the story of mud happening here, if that makes any sense at all. So like, the water of the death card is what is disrupting the solid earth and transforming it into mud. And it feels like a slog, but with enough strength to impose yourself on it and create something with it, it can be utilized to create a new structure. Um, there's kind of a lot of earth and fire going back and forth here, I think. You've got, you know, fire, fire, earth, fire, earth. Um, and I feel like that reminds me a bit of making and firing pottery from mud and clay. So, like, with the Knight of Wands, you get the creative spark and drive. I'll just pull this here so you can see it. You get the creative spark and drive to uh, take control of the mud through creation. And with the Emperor, you are imposing that will in a structured way. So you're sort of forming the initial shape of the pottery. And the devil is kind of like the mud fighting back a little bit. <laughs> um, like, you need to have that balance of working with the inherently messy qualities of the material, but still imposing enough order onto it um, for it to get the shape that you want. The Six of Wands is then the completion of that process and the actual firing of the pottery. Um, it's sort of like a victory over the raw material. And the Knight of Pentacles is then the refining moments, either of glazing and finishing the piece, or just of having your process refined enough that you are able to repeat it and make more pottery without as much struggle from before. And I don't know how much this will end up relating back to mud <laughs> exactly, but I'm gonna roll with it. Another story that I see here is a knighthood story, um, one kind of like a peasant's revolution against a tyrannical king or emperor. Um, the knight sort of starts in this state of ignorance about the possible difficulty of a revolution. So those people who are afraid of the strength of the king and the powers that be, or are afraid of the upheaval and uncertainty that will come after a revolution, the knight is basically ignoring those warnings because those warnings are based in fear. And, um being able to ignore those warnings and not have that fear is ultimately what gives them their confidence. So um, the earth then is basically giving the gift of no fear. Uh, you can see here that the rat pictured is facing left toward the king, um, or, you know, the emperor. I'm going to refer to it as a king just because I keep picturing tyrannical king. But yeah, like they're facing left toward the king, but they are not seeing the big, scary demon that is protecting the king because, you know, they're blindfolded. Um, so then the knight takes up the horse and the weapon and charges into battle. Um, the moon here then is kind of giving the gift of asserting oneself. Um, the knight of wands, I think, is definitely the expression of assertive power, like, imposing yourself and imposing your will into the situation, kind of against all odds. Uh, this is also where I get the disruptive or subversive element, um, and you can kind of see that just sort of by nature of the Knight of Wands, but also because the uh, knight is again going left. And I tend to see the left as um, back and the right as forth, like going back and going forth. Um, the left is sort of like a non-traditional path. You sort of hear that phrase of like the left-hand path, um, which is sort of seen as, you know, it can sometimes be phrased as like the evil path, but, you know, just in general, I see it as like the non-traditional path or the path of going back and changing things as opposed to just plowing forward. Um, and again, it's facing left toward the tyrannical king. And the reason I say 
this is a tyrannical king and not just like a regular one. Is there such a thing as a regular as opposed to not tyrannical king? <laughs> you decide. But the reason I say this is a tyrannical king is because he seems guarded by the devil. So he's sort of exercising an evil control. If we're going with like the classic concept of the devil, um, it could be that he's controlled by the devil or is otherwise in league with the devil, which um, is something that is very classic that people will say to represent what they see as an oppressive force. And, you know, this guy really just doesn't look very friendly also. Um, and like the king feels safe in asserting his will because he's doing so from on high in a way. There are a lot of barriers put in place, both physical, um, like these big giant stair steps that are above all else. You have the moat of fire here that's like, that's definitely a physical barrier um, to sort of keep him safe and keep his his will, um, keep him feeling safe in asserting his will. Um, and then you also have the mental fear, uh, or like the, the mental barriers, um, which is, which is fear and, uh, you know, fear that the that the devil keeps in place or fear what will happen. Basically all of the fears that the, some people had, <laughs> um, and that sort of prevents him from being usurped or, or helps him feel like he could be prevented from being usurped and, and definitely other people, you know, are afraid of him. <laughs> so the knight is ultimately able to overcome these barriers with their own confidence and assertion. Um, maybe even realizing that the barriers aren't as strong as people make them out to be, or by not having them see, not having seen them to be that strong to begin with. And basically once that happens, the power structure crumbles and you get transformation. You get the transformation of death. Um, the death of the tyrannical king. <laughs> um, I love how the wolf knight here, um, although clearly riding to the right, indicating moving to the new, away from the tyrannical king, uh, they're still looking back to the left and they're sticking their tongue out. Um, <laughs> and it's sort of like a final show that the devil and the emperor, or, you know, the devil and the tyrannical king don't have any real power only the power that we give them. And when that power is being um, misused, uh, then we can take away that power just as easily. <laughs> and I don't know, I just think the sticking the tongue out is so... I love it. it. It sort of links back to the ridiculousness that I was talking about earlier. Sorry about any cut, my battery ran out right in the middle. <laughs> but basically, like, you have the... Um, you have the knight returning as a people's hero and they come back and have achieved victory over the tyrannical king and um, they're marching forward again to towards the right to create a new, more equal society of sorts. And here I want to point out that I think it's really cool how once the knight takes up arms, so after the uh, two of swords under here, then every card features them on a horse. <laughs> so the knight is riding a horse into battle and then riding a horse back. Um, and I just really love that. There's a lot that you could go into about symbolism of the horse, but you know, this is getting crazy long as it is. So I'll, I'll leave that for another time, but I do, I, I just really appreciate that little, uh, continuity. Um, yeah. So six of wands, knight returns as a people's hero. And then the knight of pentacles, I see is sort of what happens after that. Um, the thing that pops into my head is the redistribution of wealth to the people because they are holding a pentacle and, you know, holding a coin. And it just, I just feel like it's sort of like taking the wealth that was once the uh, tyrannical kings or the emperors and now, um, and and taking it out of there and, and sharing it with the people. Um, and I feel like it's sort of, representing the slow and steady um, creation of new, more equitable structures. Um, and another reason that I see all this as sort of like a people's revolt story is because the Knight of Pentacles, again, is associated with Virgo, which is a sign that likes to improve things. And it's also a very service-oriented sign and, and sort of an other-oriented sign where, you know, it wants to be of service to others. Um, and... I think the fact that it's 
still a knight feels like there's still a newness and creativity of sorts to it. Um, like the structures that are put in place aren't just going to be repeats of the old. It's going to be, you know, the knight is still asserting their will, which essentially the knight is representing the will of the people. Um, and, and I don't know. I just, I just like that. I think that, I think that it shows that the structures are going to be new and they really are going to be facing forward and doing new things, um, that are going to be more equitable. So yeah, I really like this whole story of, uh, people's revolt. I think it's very poignant on a societal level and also on a personal level of not letting the powers that be walk all over you out of fear. Thank you for watching. I would love to hear what sort of associations you have with the February moon, your thoughts on moon naming in general, or how you choose to name the moons, um, how you work around the full moon if you do a full moon tarot reading, and if you have any other thoughts or symbols or experiences uh, relating to mud or that the name mud moon makes you think of. Thank you for watching and take care. Bye.